Right, fatty. Animal lovers do not make good zookeepers. Uh, if, they, if they're too much of a, what we call a bunny hugger, you know, because there's a lot of unpleasant things happen when you're working with animals. Activity. Things die and things move and things get injured and you've got to deal with that, you know. I'm like a pin cushion today. We have to catch our red pandas up for a general health check, which we haven't done on them for a while. Right, I'll jump in, Cheryl, you pass her over. There's nothing uh, to compare with getting, getting hands on with it and checking the, its feet, the soles of its feet, its teeth inside its mouth. Um, Come on, then. Checking its, uh, its limbs, its mobility. Come on, babe. Home sweet home. And if they're asleep, they don't know what's going on, so... You couldn't do it with them awake. They've got to be asleep. Whoa. Gently. Good girl. There's a lot of stuff here that, that I particularly like uh, working with. The zebras, the rhino, the cats, the, the owls, the red pandas. It's a beautiful uh, landscape park where people can come and just relax and picnic and stuff. So it, the, whole, the whole package seems to, seems to work really well. I've always thought that there's two kinds of people in zoos. There's zoo people who live and breathe it, and there's people who happen to be working in a zoo. There's a big gap between the two. Uh, and like all zoos, we've got both. <laughs> A dive in the wool zoo person is someone who, if you go into their house, there's rows of books on zoos. Most of their friends are zookeepers. When they're on holiday, they'll visit zoos. I, mean, I really think they're born with it, because that's all I ever was interested in. You just, you're just born with it, you know. The, um, the early morning checks, the most important part of the keeper's routine, because that's when you see if there's been any deaths overnight or any births or injuries, stuff like that. I mean, it's just, just making sure that everybody's OK. And that's just what I'm doing with these girls. And they all look okay, and uh, they're itching to get out. You're staying in. I've been working with zebra on and off for 30 years. I think I like them because uh, I started working with zebras, so that probably set the pattern for what I enjoy working with. These are three of our older mares. There's a, the nearest one is Zippy, the very dark one. In between is Zilla, and the far, the far one is Sheila. Uh, she's 30. She's the oldest zebra we've got here. In, in the wild, they would be, they'd be long dead, probably. <laughs> but in captivity, they're, they're hanging on in there. They've done their bit, they've had their foals, and now they're just kind of like in retirement, so to speak. You, just, you, you always feel fond of old animals. I do feel fond of old animals, because um, I'm getting old myself. Oh, well, Jesse's there. That's one I've spotted. Animals tend to live a lot longer in captivity than they would in the wild, but they still get the problems uh, that you and I would get. Our old male leopard is, is really old now, and he's, he's blind. Uh, he limps, he's got arthritis, but he gets around. He can still climb to the top of the enclosure. He trips over a log occasionally, but he's, you know, he's, he's in fairly good physical condition and not suffering. So what, what do you do? We let him live out his life, but eventually we'll have to make the decision and, you know, his keepers have looked after him most of his life. Um, you have animals here that can, you know, live for 40, 50 years, and, and some keepers have been here almost 30 years and looked after those animals. The Asiatic lion is the, obviously, it speaks for itself, they're lions from Asia but they're much rarer than the more well-known African lion. In biblical times, they had a huge range all through India, Pakistan, Iran, Kazakhstan. They were hunted and hunted and hunted right down to a tiny population in one forest in northwest India. Now, there's a couple of hundred there protected and a similar number in captivity, of which Sabu and Akila are a part of that. He's a grumpy lion, he's a very grumpy lion. He doesn't tend to like any of us, but he really hates his regular keeper and would uh, eat him as first choice, I think, if he got out. She's good, she's a nice lioness. She'll come over for a tickle and a stroke. He doesn't like her doing that, he gets jealous. He doesn't like her interacting with us. 
these two are here obviously as part of the international captive breeding program and they've successfully reared two litters here and those cubs are now part of their own families in Nuremberg Zoo, Frankfurt Zoo, Prague Zoo and London Zoo. Come on, big man, good boy. Oh, we should. Oh, who are these? Let's go. Sab, come on. Sabu, come on. Come on, sweetie. Good girl. There's a good girl. You going out? Yep. She oh. Here at the park, almost all the keepers are accommodated very close to the to the park itself, literally on the doorstep. All right, and that's a good thing because obviously, you know, if one of your colleagues is one of your friends as well, it's it's, it's uh, good for the social side of things. All the accommodation for the keepers are down one street, almost like Ramsey Street in Neighbours. But yeah, it is almost a little, a small village of of just animal folk, I suppose. <laughs> nice day, Chris. Lovely, yeah. That's a change. Uh, right. So that's ready for action. Uh, we've got a, um, a firm of, of vets fairly local to us. Uh, they come as a matter of course every Wednesday, whether we've got anything for them to see or not. And obviously they're on call pretty much 24 hours a day. Today we've got our male scimitar horned oryx and his hooves are slightly overgrown, so today it's a basic case of knocking him out and tidying his feet up. Um. He's just going very wobbly on his feet, he's very unsteady, but the dart, because he was moving around, didn't go right in the ideal muscle spot, so the absorption is going to, probably going to be a bit slower. So I think it's working, but whether he'll be flat deep enough to actually go in there and get him, I don't know, we'll have to wait and see, but he's, he's half down now, look, he's, he's getting a bit wobbly. Whoops, there we go. Just keep the door free for the moment, because we need to make a fast exit. Do you want to watch this door? Right. See, I'll just show you these feet, because they're very overgrown here. There's some dead infected hoof here, where they've got to, it's got overgrown, and then um, sand and dirt gets driven into, <coughs> driven into the cracks and co set, can set off an infection, so we just want to trim it back to nice, normal, healthy hoof. And then it'll keep him going for a bit longer then. <coughs> OK, we're going to give him the antidotes now. Once we've given the antidote, we've all got to get out because they usually come around within a few minutes. A bit okay. Yeah, OK, let's get in this in. Right, let's put some of this under the skin. That's it, that's in the bloodstream. Right, so this is the other one. So the minute this goes in, we all need to just move out of the way. OK, right. Right, OK, so somebody got all this stuff and then we'll just leave him be. We've really got our stuff here, yeah, that's it. Okay. Right, so we're gonna let him out back into the into the paddock with the rest of them. Obviously, with the sort of some of the animals we've got here, we have to have a dangerous wild animal escape team. This team basically will respond immediately if the call comes out that, that something does escape. Make sure the gun's seated tightly to the shoulder and just follow through. We have a list of category one animals and category two. Uh, category two are animals that, that are potentially dangerous but can be darted or, or netted. And then when you've finished, Break the gun again, hold it down, and then wait for the next cartridge or another shot. Category one are animals which, once they're out, 
uh, we need to deal with the situation straight away and that would usually involve um, basically shooting uh, to kill. Yeah, all fairly simple. Yeah. Okay. That's it then, let's give it a go. It's useful for everyone to know how to use the guns in case the, the day comes we have to use one. Right. Pull! I'm quite pleased with that. The trouble is, it's very hard to practice something like this because it's such an organic experience. You never quite know how it's going to evolve or what's going to happen. But you get clay pigeon shooting to get us used to guns. Just lean into the gun slightly. Shout, pull, pull, pull of the clay. And then as it floats up. It is a tricky balance with that because you do have people here who are very passionate about their animals. Pull. But all the people here, reluctantly, they would all understand that safety's first. You know, if a lion or a leopard was out, no matter how much you like that animal, you've got to take into account get it comfy. The, the safety of everyone is paramount. Um, and you just have to take the necessary action. Well, But I think it would almost certainly be the case where the person on, on the firing end of the gun would not be the person looking after that animal. In the autumn, it could be quite a nerve-wracking time, actually, uh, for us, because we've got a lot of plants in the garden which are quite frost tender, but we don't know when the frost is going to come. At the same time, we want to leave the displays out as long as possible. So that means it's uh, a question of um, sort of holding your nerve sometimes, and you hear there might be a frost or whatever. It's quite important to understand where these plants come from and their, their sort of life cycles. And if we know that, we're a long way to be able to provide them with the, the conditions they need and the, the appropriate conditions at the right time of year. That's the key thing, really. We try to keep the exotics going for as long as possible, but most of these plants are too tender to survive a Cotswolds winter. I'm just putting some antibiotics down a chick's throat. We've been trying it with meat, but sometimes he spits the meat out. We're trying it in chicks today. Come on, Sabu. Come on, then. Sabu, our Asian lion, um, Come on. a few months ago suffered a, an Come anal on. prolapse. Come on. Come on, then. But the vet came out and uh, we sedated him, popped the prolapse back in, gave him some injections. And this injection, we thought, had irritated him because he kept licking his leg. Come on. Eventually, these slight like, skin lesions appeared. Oh dear. He'd also developed this, these skin lesions around his face as well. Come on, chicken. So the vet took some swabs. Come on. Come on then. It got worse, basically. A week later, the biopsy test had come back and uh, he was found to have a form of the pox virus. So, uh, now we're sort of uh, we're treating him with antibiotics, stronger antibiotics. Not interested, are you? No, he's not. I mean, getting medication into him is difficult. I mean, normally he's quite fiery. Come on, come on then. And as soon as he sees a keeper, he'll come and he'll jump at the mesh or whatever. But uh, being sort of down in the dumps, he's obviously not feeling him feeling good in himself. Um, we're basically treating him with the antibiotics on a piece of meat but that's that's the only way you can do it really it's like a domestic cat you just put it in its food or you you just grab hold of the cat and force it down the throat or whatever but so you can't do that with a lion obviously come on you got to take six of these come on and it's just a waiting game really i think we have to try again later we're just hoping that he's going to recover from it
Right, okay then Dave. Yeah, first, first job of the morning really is to boo the uh, male Asiatic lion. Is, um, mm. And the condition's been deteriorating over the last week. He was feeding but not well uh, and we're having trouble now even getting the, the, the drugs in him. Well I'll go and have a look. Obviously it's a bit disappointing because he has done quite well. But the situation, as you know, is that there isn't any specific sure. antiviral treatment for this cowpox infection that he's got. Oh, if you go down and have a look, yeah. um, see what you think. Yeah. We're obviously all concerned for his welfare now. Yeah. I really will leave the decision yeah. to you, I think. God, he's lost a terrific amount of weight, hasn't he? Come on, have a grab. Come on. Oh, dear. It's grim, isn't it? So basically, it's the books say that in big cats, it, it, it often is fatal. It gets in the system and it's just fatal. And that's what's happening, isn't it? I mean, it's spreading right through it. <coughs> right, all pretty grim news on the lion on the front. He's, he's really has taken a turn for the worse. And these, uh, these pox virus lesions have spread. Um, so he's just lying there now and he's obviously pretty unhappy. Um, and the worry is they've almost certainly got into his internal organs because he's stopped eating and he's lost an awful lot of weight in the last week. So I think we're going to have to, um, you know, let him, let him go to sleep, poor old chap. That's the kindest thing to do. Yeah, I know, old chap. You get really, really attached to these animals, and uh, and obviously keepers cry over over animals dying, um, and that, that's that's not a bad thing. I don't think that's a bad thing. It, it, there has to be a degree of uh, emotional involvement. In a way, you want the world to stop and take notice, but you can't expect that. And it doesn't happen with people, so it's certainly not going to happen with animals. Obviously, we're dealing with situations like that in our own way, uh, every member of staff. And for the people going around, it's still their visit to the park. It might be the only visit they make in a year, it's their visit to the park, they want to have a nice day. Um, they, they'll read the sign that the animal's off show because it's ill, and they'll move on to the next exhibit, you know. And then the next time they come back, they might, if it's high profile, they might say, whatever happened to that lion or that zebra or whatever. Um, it's just one of these things. It's, uh, it's our side of the park. Their side of the park is very different. Theirs is a day out, you know. Zoos are all about life cycles. Animals are born, animals die, animals move on to other collections, and new animals arrive. So today's quite an exciting day for us. We have a new male bamboo lemur that arrived, um, and we're actually going to introduce him to the female today. The, the grill dividing the two enclosures has given the two animals an opportunity to see each other and smell each other. And so once I take this grill away, they'll have the opportunity to mix together, um, interact with each other, um, hopefully become close friends. Now it may be that nothing happens at all for a little while, but we'll have to wait and see. Hello. Come on in, boy. Go and see your missus. He's looking down towards the hatch. What I'm really hoping he'll do is hop through. He's probably just a little bit bewildered about what's happened because yesterday he was in France and today he's in the Cotswolds. I think I'm going to come out again and just leave them to it for a while. It might just be that it does take a lot longer than I thought. The male arrived yesterday and he's actually in the far side. The female's in this side. but. She's right on top of her box hiding, and he's in his box on the far side. Oh, um, what, so she's up in this bit? Yeah, she's, you can't, unfortunately you can't see her. I was hoping to be able to mix them today, but they're, they're oh, choosing not to do... Yeah, they're a bit shy, not doing too much. So oh, I'm just watching them to see what happens, really. OK, well, as you know, our boy Sabu um, was very, very ill, and sadly, the decision was made um, to put him down, so that's him gone, um, and we have to wait and see what happens now. Re lions here at the park. Small feed for Madam. See so if she'll come in. But for the time being, she's on her own. She seems okay. She's a, her behaviour's a wee bit funny, 
because uh, she will be missing. She will be missing him, you know. She's been with him all this time. I don't know whether she knows he's dead or not, but she's, he's gone, you know, suddenly. Ah, brilliant. The female has actually gone through from this side into the side where the male is. But that's definitely a positive move because she's, she's gone in to meet him, so I'm just going to pop in there now. Um, they're both, I can tell by their actions, they're both very calm, very relaxed. I quite enjoy doing this mixing because you never know what's going to happen. You've always got to have that um, kind of awareness and be prepared for the worst, um, that they could fight, they could injure each other. So it's just the unpredictability of it and that's what goes with the, the whole job really. And obviously it is very nice to be able to, to mix these guys together and hopefully get them to breed in the not too distant future because um, they are so endangered. I'm really pleased with this, it's going really well. I think it'd just be a case now of leaving them to it and popping by frequently throughout the day and see what, how it progresses from here. The last we heard after losing Cebu was uh, because the stud book told us there wouldn't be a male available for two years. So we thought about the possibility of bringing in a young female as company for Akela. But it's now transpires we can get a male almost imminently. We're going to get a male from Bristol Zoo, the actual Cebu's twin brother. Which is, uh, is great because she'll get a mate and we'll have a male lion on show, which is always nice. Yeah? And we'll get him in and we'll have a few days of keeping them apart and then mix them and see how it goes. In the wild, if her mate had died, she would have probably vocalised and attracted another male or another male would have been in the area and, and known there was a lone female. And she wouldn't be on her own for long. Nature doesn't waste.